What are the vital signs of a healthy church? We know what the vital signs of a healthy body are, but what are the vital signs of a healthy church? In other words, how would we know that we're healthy here? Or conversely, how would we know that we're sick and we're drifting towards sickness? Because you know, you don't just drift towards health. You gotta choose, you gotta make decisions that lead to health. In fact, if you don't pay attention, you don't make decisions about health, you drift towards sickness oftentimes. And so I've just felt burdened to share with you the vital signs that, that I look for here at our church, that our staff looks for here at LCBC to determine whether or not we're healthy and to make sure that we don't drift towards sickness. And so let me just catch you up. If you haven't been here in this series or maybe it's your first time today, I'll just catch you up. These are the vital signs we've been talking about. First week we said this, a vital sign of a healthy church is that a healthy church prioritizes relationships. That's a vital sign of a healthy church. You stop prioritizing relationships with people and you will drift towards sickness as a church. You know, one of the things that Jesus said, he said, if you wanna prove to the world that you follow him, this is a crazy statement, he said, if you wanna prove to the world that you follow me, it will be proven in the way that you treat other people around you. Proven in the way that you love people. And so this is why as a church, and we've been talking about this, we're gonna be okay with people being in process here. We're okay with that. You, 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 you can belong here before you ever believe. We're gonna be a church that's okay that. This is why we're gonna be a church that shows honor to, uh, to each other in the way that we speak about and to one another. We're gonna be a church that honors each other. And we said if we're gonna prioritize relationships, we're gonna be a church that's unified in a world that just seems increasingly more and more divided. When you're here, man, we're gonna be united around the things that we have in common in Christ. So that's the first vital sign of a healthy church. Second one is this. This is what we talked about last week. A healthy church is filled with contributors, not consumers. I mean, a sick church is one where everyone shows up and makes it all about themselves. It's all about what they get out of it, what's in it for me. And we're like, we said last week, you know, I'm a big fan of Costco. That's a great way to, you know, work with Costco. That's a horrible way to be the church. Costco, you show up to be a consumer. Church, you show up to be a contributor. A healthy church is filled with people who are looking to contribute. This means that, you know, we take our gifts and our time and our energy and our resources and we contribute them. We offer them up to serve others. Actually, I got to tell you, just this week, this is so cool. Um, I just heard a story that I just wanted to share with you. A few weeks ago, there was a group of middle school girls here at our church, actually at our Columbia Montour campus up in Bloomsburg, and, and these, this group of girls went to our leadership team there and asked if they could get a list of the widows who were at that campus. And they were given a list of 15 different women who, who've been widowed, and then they proceeded to go and they made cards for them, they went and they bought them flowers, and then they personally delivered all of them to those widows on Valentine's Day. This is a picture, actually, this is the group of girls who were making the thing, and then we'll go to the next picture. This was, aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful that the next generation at this church is already living as contributors, not consumers? Now, I'm grateful. I don't know if you know how rare that is, but I know how rare it is. And I'm so grateful to be part of a church where that's happening. We are contributors here. We're not consumers. We show up and we ask, what can I bring, not what did I get out of this? And so today, I just want to talk about the last key vital sign that's a marker of a healthy church that I just want us to always monitor here. And this one, it might be the most important one of all of them. See, you know, you can have high blood pressure and still live. Some of the men in the room are like, yeah, I know. You, you can have a temperature that's off and still live. You can have erratic or shallow breathing and still live. But if you don't have a pulse, you're not making it. And I want to tell you what I believe our pulse is here at this church. Our heart, like if this stops happening, the thing we're going to talk about today, this vital sign, if this stops happening, our heart has stopped. And to do that, I want to start where we've started each week of this series. I want us to look at the very first picture, the very first description that we have in all of the New Testament of a church. It's such a compelling passage. This is what it says. This is in Acts chapter 2. It says, all the believers, they met together in one place. They shared everything that they had. They sold their property, possessions. They shared with the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God, and listen to this, enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. It's these last two statements right here I actually just want to focus in on today. See, it says that they had, they had the goodwill, they had favor with all people. Now, all people means all people, not just people who were already at the church, but people who were in the community who were not a part of the church. People outside the church 
looked favorably on them. And I cannot help but notice that in the very first picture that we have of a church, it describes a people whose lives are so marked by love and service and grace and generosity that people who didn't even believe what they believed wanted to be around them. It's like others were looking in on them and saying, man, I, I can't believe what they believe. I don't know if I believe and buy all this Jesus stuff, but I sure do hope my daughter marries one of them because I've seen how they live. I've seen how they treat people. I don't know if I can believe what they believe. I don't know what the Bible's all true. I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of skeptical about a few things, but I sure do hope I work for one one day because I've seen how they treat people. You see what's happening? And because of this, people each day were giving their lives to Jesus Christ. What did it say? It said the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. In other words, there's growth happening. What's happening there is attractive and it is compelling to people who don't even follow Jesus and they're making, and the people who do follow Jesus are making more room. They're opening up for people to come and find hope in Christ. See, this is the very first picture that we have of a church and it is a group of people who are not resistant to broken and lost and hurting and sinful people. They don't keep them at an arm's length. Rather, they make room for them and they invite them in. And this is the last vital sign I want to look at. You say it this way. Healthy churches are outward focused. Always. Healthy churches are always outward focused. I don't think you need me to convince you of this, but the gravitational pull of any organization, and in particular any church, is always towards the insider. It's just the gra it's like a black hole of insiderishness. Just sucks us in. The gravitational pull is towards those who are already here. Why? Because we like each other, and it's safe. However, the very first picture that we have of a dynamic, thriving, life-giving church is that they were outward-focused. They gained favor with all people, and they made room for people to come in and discover new life in Christ. And the reason they did this was because they were driven by one of the very last commands that Jesus ever gave his followers. This is what Jesus said. Matthew 28, he said, Jesus came and he told his disciples, disciples just means his followers, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. More followers. Go and point people to me. Now, I just want to point out something real quick. Who's Jesus talking to here? You know, he's not talking to pastors. He didn't say, so if you're a pastor, I need to tell you what to go do. He's not saying, uh, if you work at a church, here's what you do. He's not so talking to people who have a Bible degree in college or something like that. He's talking to anybody who follows him. Anybody. Any life changed by Christ. And he's saying, look, if you are a life changed by Christ, you have a vocation now in life. I'm giving you the mission. Go and point people to me. And see, here's what always strikes me about this statement that Jesus made. See, Jesus could have just said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore, therefore, make disciples. But isn't it interesting that he qualified it, that he nuanced it, and put in the word go and make disciples? See, I just wonder if part of the reason Jesus said to go, it's like he needed to remind us to go, it's because he knows something about the human condition, that once the church started to gather together, the most natural inclination would actually be to stay, to huddle up together, to stay real close to each other, and forget that there is a world out there in need of Jesus. See, I think Jesus it's saying, man, he, it's like he's redirecting our focus here. It's like he's saying, I, I know that your impulse will be to play it safe. I know that. Just focus on who's already here. But I'm giving you a new impulse to go. Because there is a world in need of hope, and I'm sending you out. There's a story in the book of Mark that puts this impulse to go on display I, I, in such a powerful way. I've read this story more times than I could probably count over the years, and yet recently it just kind of grabbed a hold of my heart again and just stirred me up about what's possible when a group of people are outward focused. The particular story happens when Jesus, he, he's at a home one day, and he starts speaking to a crowd. 
And this often happened when Jesus was speaking that, you know, a crowd begins to gather and then the crowd grows larger and larger and larger and the homes weren't huge back in the first century and so this home got filled up real quick. There's no more room in the home anymore, but people kept coming and now the area outside of the home, imagine like your front yard now is also filled. So every single aspect, every single part of this property is packed with people. But there's a group of guys that is about to disrupt all of it in the best kind of way. Is what it says in Mark chapter two. It says, while he was preaching, so while that's Jesus, while Jesus was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. It's too crowded. It's too packed. They can't get the man on the mat through the crowd. So they're at a decision point, these four men now. They got a decision in front of them. The crowd's too big. They can't make their way to Jesus. Do they just give up? Do they look at their friend in need? Do they look at their friend on the mat and be like, hey, dude, we tried. Sorry, man, maybe next time. No, they don't do any of that. Do you know what they do? I love this. This is so great. So they dug a hole through the roof to which the homeowner was like, what the heck, man? Like, my insurance, does that, what am I claiming with my insurance for this? Dug a hole through the roof. Man lowered on mat. They dug a hole through the roof above his head and then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Now, can you imagine right now, whatever room you're sitting in, you start hearing some clawing and some scratching in the ceiling above you, and then a hole opens up? I mean, this is a scene that they're creating. And the roofs in the first century, they were, kinda, they were made of a combination of thatch and mud and palm branches laid over some beans. And so it, with enough effort, you could start digging into it. And I know that it says that they dug into the roof, but I think that probably misses the intensity of this moment. In fact, some scholars say that the language that was used here to describe what happened that day would actually be better translated that they were tearing into the roof, doing whatever they can. It's like they're thrashing, they're moving things around, they're digging with a ferocity. There's a force behind it. And I just need you to understand this because I need you to get the picture here. These four friends are doing whatever, they, whatever it takes, whatever they have to do to get their friend in front of Jesus. That's what's happening. And here's Jesus' response. Seeing their faith. Now remember that. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. To which the man on the mat said, but I came for my legs. No, I'm kidding. He didn't say that. That's not in my mind. <laughs> but you would have been thinking it, and I would have been thinking it. See, what's interesting, actually, kind of go with that for a second. What's interesting is that Jesus is, you know, Jesus saying that your sins are forgiven, this actually creates all sorts of a stir that day in the crowd. Because there were some religious leaders who were there at the time. They did not like this. In fact, they accused Jesus of blasphemy because they were like, only God can forgive sins. To which Jesus is like, yeah, you're missing the point. And then he says, okay, all right, well, what's easier, to say that your sins are forgiven to this guy or to say stand up and walk? He goes, all right, fine, stand up and walk. And the guy stands up and walks. And this man is forever changed on that day. But the most significant, please hear this, the most significant change and transformation was not the one that happened with his legs. See, Jesus knows something. And he's telling us something. He's telling us that the greatest healing we need in our lives is not physical, it's spiritual. Did you know that? For you, for me, that's the greatest need we have. And see, some of you, I know, because I know some of your stories, some of you, 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 want, you want the physical around you to change. You want the circumstances to change. And Jesus says, I, I can do that, but that's not your greatest need. Your greatest need is for me to change something inside of you, to transform your heart, to wake your heart up to the reality of God's love. And Jesus says, that's the ultimate work I wanna do in you. And Jesus is the only one uniquely qualified to heal our greatest need, the separation from God that our sin has created. And what was it on that day? Now here's the question. What was it on that day, all those years ago, in that crowded home, what was it that activated the healing work of Jesus in that man's life? What was it that stirred up the heart of Jesus? Well, he tells us, seeing their 
faith. The friend's faith. Not even the guy on the mat. How do you see faith, by the way? You ever thought about that? I mean, you know, probably intuitively, you see faith in actions, right? That's, faith always demonstrates itself in actions. It's not just something you believe in your head. It always demonstrates so, itself in action. And Jesus saw in their actions such a fierce belief and commitment that they believed Jesus was the only one who could truly heal their friend, that they were willing to do whatever they needed to do to at least get their friend in front of Jesus. And Jesus honored that. He was moved by that. There was a crowd, I mean, you guys know, there was a crowd gathered around Jesus that day. They were, a lot of people there, attentive, actively listened, all facing forward, like Jesus nodding, you know, like get, doing the cow thing, mm -hmm, right, you know, every now and then. But there were only four that moved the heart of Jesus to action. And it was the four who did not look at who was already in the room that day, but they saw who wasn't there. Their friend on the mat. The four who would rip off roofs in order to get that person to Jesus. And I, I've told you a little bit of my story, but I'll just tell you that's the kind of church, that is the kind of church, those are the kind of people I needed most when I was 20 years old and I had run so far from God. You want to talk about a mat? I was on a mat. My legs work just fine, but I know what it feels like to be stuck and paralyzed in life. Maybe some of you do too. I have my own mat, man. I was stuck and paralyzed by porn. I was stuck. I was paralyzed by lies. You wouldn't even believe. I, my whole life was a lie. I was paralyzed by all the people I used. Unable to move forward and running from God, running, running, running from God. And there was a part of me, and maybe you can relate to this, that was absolutely confident at that season in my life that if I was lowered down from a ceiling in front of Jesus, at that, at that moment in my life, you know what I would get from Jesus? I would get condemnation. I was convinced of that. I was convinced that if someone were to lower me down in front of Jesus, the only thing I'm getting is judgment. I was convinced that if I were lowered down, Jesus would actually see me and turn away disgusted by what he saw. But thank God there was a church. There was a church, a group of people who saw that I was on a mat and they kept inviting me. They kept inviting me in to explore Jesus. And they kept praying for me. And they kept opening up their lives to me and my life was changed because I discovered that Jesus does not run away from our brokenness and sin and disgust. He moves towards us in love. Always towards us in love and offers us grace and forgiveness. And our church here LCBC, we, you know, we started in a garage in Lancaster County almost 38 years ago. 40 people, right around that, around 40 people with a vision to start a new church. But if you've ever been to Lancaster County, then you know there's actually two churches for every one person in Lancaster County. Lancaster County didn't really need a new church, but see, that was the entire point. They didn't just want to be a church like every other church that they had experienced up to that point. They wanted to be a church for people who'd given up on church. They wanted to be a church for people, a church that was committed to fighting the gravitational pull towards all being about the insiders and being who's already there, but instead they were going to be a church that was committed to going. And since our earliest days as a church, man, we have kept this urgency in front of us, the urgency of continuing to join God and his work in this world for all the people around us who are on mats right now. And that commitment from those earliest days in a garage you think about this, it has led to places nobody ever imagined it would lead us as a church. I promise you those 40 people in the garage 38 years ago did not imagine what God was gonna do with a group of people, because all he needs is four, with a group of people willing to tear off roofs to get others to Jesus. I mean, it's amazing to think about the story that God's writing and has written with our church and continues to write. We got 21 locations now across the eastern side of Pennsylvania, all the way up in Dixon City and Wilkes-Barre and 
you know, Clark Summit all the way down to Waynesboro, which I call the Alabama of Pennsylvania. Those are my people. <laughs> Waynesboro, I love you. <laughs> From there, all the way over to the sprawling suburbs of Montgomery County. Such a diverse group of people who are committed and rallied around finding hope in Jesus. And what's so much fun is we're not done. Even this year, we've got two more locations that we're looking to get up and running. Just a few weeks from now, we're launching our West York campus. I cannot wait. There's an incredibly strong core group that's come together for that. We're working plans right now to develop a Pottstown. Um, so hopefully a year from now, we've got something running up in Pottstown. So that's all coming right now. That's all happening. What's also fun is we've got five different um, locations across the state that we would just call community gatherings. They're not full, you know, they're not a fully built out campus yet. They don't offer everything that a campus offers, but there's groups of people anywhere from 50, 80, to almost 100 people now meeting in different places that are just coming together as LCBC Church, watching the gatherings, beginning to live as LCBC Church from Altoona and Williamsport State College on the campus of Penn State, Sealands Grove, uh, Bethlehem. It's amazing to see what's happening. Not only that, you can clap. Not only that, but we've, we know that if we're going to blanket the state of Pennsylvania, if we've got more that we, God is calling us to do, we can't, it's not on us. We can't LCBC church do, do all. We need to partner. We need to work with any churches that are outward-focused churches and outward-facing churches. I hope you know that other churches are not competition. We're on the same team. Our competition is apathy and brokenness and addiction and sin. That's our competition. And any outward-facing church that wants to, is on mission to reach people, man, we're going to work together better than ever before to go, let's go on mission together. We've got 62 churches all represented here. These are 62 churches, these yellow dots, that are ne actually next month, a few weeks from now, all coming here, coming together to say, how do we work better together? How do we do this? Because we've got a mission, man. This is a heat map. When you think about online, I'll just show you real quick where people are uh, tuning into LCBC Church online. I was like, give me a heat map, show me. So you've got what looks like a blob now, but this represents where people are tuning in LCBC Church online. Apparently, no one lives here, so <laughs> just, just elk. This is all the people who've been tuning in, though. This is like pockets and groups of people who've been tuning in just in the last 28 days, by the way. Just in the last 28 days. You want to hear something crazy? Let me show you a picture of the country. This is just the last 28 days across the country of people who've been a part of LCBC Church Online. So I just want to, I want to point out what everybody's thinking. We're working on South Dakota. We're, we're going to reach them. There's seven people who live there, and we're going after them. <laughs> you know what's crazy? We've had, actually, in the last year, every state represented who've been a part of LCBC Online. Every continent has been represented um, as well, tuning in. In fact, even Antarctica, because someone on their cruise around Antarctica joined us for LCBC Online. And I just gotta say, you know, for as many incredible things that we have seen and that we continue to see at this, at this church, I cannot help but think of all the people that we know in our lives that are still on the mat. They're still on mats. Our friends and our neighbors and our roommates, the brothers in our fraternity, the sisters in our sorority, our coworkers, people on mats that God loves so deeply and who Jesus gave his life for. You know, 49%, half of our state, 49% of people in Pennsylvania report significant levels of loneliness. And I'm not dumb enough to think that that's just out there. That's in this room too, I know that. It's people on the mat. 21%, one out of every five people um, of adults in Pennsylvania have been diagnosed with depression. That's a diagnosis, which means there's so many more struggling. Each day, on average, five people in our state lose their lives to suicide. One out of every five people in Pennsylvania struggles with alcohol dependence. Two out of every three people don't attend a religious group or engage in prayer and scripture. That's eight and a half million people in our state. When people tell me that we're a big church, you know what my response is now to them? I always go, compared to what? Big church, compared to what? They, I, I think it's incredibly cool. It's super cool to see all the growth we've experienced. I don't compare us to what's been, though. I only comparison I ever make is to what's left to be done. We haven't scratched the surface. There are more people on mats. Guys, there are mats all around us. 
And we're surrounded by people who are paralyzed right now by addiction. We're surrounded by people who are paralyzed in their marriages. They just need some hope, man. They're on their last string. People who've had relationships dissolve and it's got them on a map. People who are paralyzed by shame. They can't move past their past. People who are paralyzed by grief and they feel stuck. We are going to be a church of outward focus, rip the roof off people who go and keep carrying people here to meet Jesus. Let me tell you what that means for us. I'll just tell you three implications. It's like graduation. I feel like I want to say, like, hold your applause until everybody has been recognized or something. Let me tell you three implications of what this means for us. Here, here's what it means. If we're going to be that, here's what it, you clap, but let me just, here's what it means for us before you clap. This is what it's going to mean, right? It means we're going to be a church that tries new things to reach new people. We have to. You know, those four friends that day were wildly creative, weren't they, in how they got that man in front of Jesus? They tried new things. Front door wouldn't work? Fine. That's fine. Let's go up to the roof. They had a bias towards action because they knew what was at stake, and it disrupted things, and it made a scene, but it was done in the name of trying to get, uh, trying something at least, anything, to try to get that man in front of Jesus. In order to reach people that others aren't willing to reach, we're going to have to do some things here that others aren't willing to do. We're gonna talk about things that others might not be willing to talk about because we gotta keep it real. We gotta speak relevantly into people's lives. We're gonna push the envelope at times to try to speak relevantly into people's lives. And some of the things we'll try, I can promise you, you may not like. Spoiler alert. Some of the series we do may be on the edge for you. Some of the songs we do, you may not prefer. Some things, that we'll, some things we're going to get right, some things we're going to get wrong, we'll learn from it. But you should just know, I just want you to know this, we are okay. I tell our staff this. Um, just talk, took new staff. We had 30-something new staff come in through orientation this week. Here's one of the things I told them. I just said, well, look, we're, we are completely okay as a church if 90% of our people are wildly enthusiastic and 10% are wildly upset. We're good with that. Because that probably means we're doing something on the edge. And I just learned a long time ago that trying to please everyone is the fast track to pleasing nobody. So our mission isn't to make everybody happy here. Our mission is to introduce more people to Jesus and together fully follow him. And we are laser focused on that right now. So we're gonna try new things to reach new people. Here's a second implication. If we're gonna be an outward facing church, it means that we're gonna set aside personal preferences to reach new people. We're gonna set aside personal preference. That's what we do here. You know, my guess is those four friends, they didn't prefer, I mean, I don't know, but I'm guessing they didn't prefer to have to carry a grown man through a crowd. I mean, they'd rather be like, you know, on their phones or something. They didn't prefer to have to make a scene, but what they preferred wasn't the priority. The priority was getting that man to Jesus. This is what we do here. We set aside personal preferences to reach new people. What does that mean? We gladly give up our seats for others. You're like, yeah, but that's my row. It's like, no, it's not, man. It doesn't belong to you. We give up our seats for others. It's like, but I prefer, okay, fine, but we give up our seats. You know what it means? It means we consider moving gathering times at times because the gathering's too full and we need to open up seats. Hanover, if you're at the 10 a.m., you may need to move because that gathering is too crowded. And you know what I would hate? I would hate if a family of four walked into our church giving it one shot and they couldn't find a seat that's not acceptable. So you're like, but we love coming in the tent. I know, I know, I got it. It's a personal preference, but man, this is what we do. We give up personal preferences to reach new people. We give, you know what I mean? We give sacrificially towards the mission here of reaching new people. You are some of the most generous people I've ever been around. I can't tell you how inspired I get when I'm around people who've been here a long, long time. And the music and the style of what we do, it's not what they would prefer. And they tell me that. But their very next sentence is, Jason, it's not about me. Because they see their family coming to Christ here. They see their friends coming to Christ and they see the way God is working and they set aside their personal preferences. That's what we do. Here's the last implication. We're gonna be outward facing church. It's gonna mean we're gonna have to be a church that makes the first move towards our communities. We don't wait. You know, Jesus didn't wait for you to take a step towards him before he took a step toward you. He's pursuing you regardless of your response. He always makes the first move. You know, the New Testament says that while we were still sinners, 
He died for us and gave his life for us. Not once we got all good, not once we got our acts together, not once we cleaned up our lives, not once we got religion, whatever that means. No, no, no. He loved us before we ever took a step towards him. And his people, his followers, are the kind of people who will always love first. No strings attached. This, this is why we've given away millions of dollars here. We've given millions of dollars away as a church to nonprofits all across the state that are doing remarkable work with those around our state who are most vulnerable. We've gladly given it, no strings attached. We wanna make the first move. This is why we packed, a few months ago, we packed uh, close to 13,000 hope packs for prisoners across the state. You did that. And we sent them into 16 different prisons because we just wanted inmates and prisoners across the state to know that there's a church in this state who loves them, that's thinking of them, because there's a God who loves them and can forgive and can make new. And this is why this spring we're gonna do something we've never done before that I'm incredibly excited about. We're actually gonna take one day, Saturday, May 18th, and I'm asking each of you to give at least one hour, all of us across all of our locations right now, to give at least one hour to serve your community. That's it. Can you imagine thousands of us across the state? You saw that map a moment ago. Thousands of us across the state concentrating our energy for just one day to serve our communities for an hour. I'm asking you now to mark that Saturday off. Not the entire Saturday. We're gonna create opportunities for you and your friends or your family. Bring your kids along. This is something you can do together. You and your spouse, you and your group, just simply give an hour to serve our communities. We're calling it Impact PA. It's on May 18th. I want you to put in your calendar now. Just block it off. Guys, if you need to put IPA day, do that. If that helps you right now, just put it in your calendar. Mark it off. I don't care. Wives, put it in there as IPA day. Your husband will be like, I can't wait. All right. I'm just telling you, Impact PA, May 18th. I and mean, you're gonna get a lot more details about this, so don't worry about it. If you don't live in the state of Pennsylvania, if you're one of those people watching online, don't live around our campus, we're gonna make sure you can participate as well, but we're just gonna put a concentrated effort into this state on that day to show up for others. Giving you a lot more details in the weeks to come, but right now, just mark that date off because we're gonna unleash a flood of generosity on our community. This is what a healthy church does. This is what a healthy church does, guys. This is a vital sign. A healthy church is outward focus. And guys, I, I wanna tell you, I think it's absolutely remarkable what God has done and is continuing to do here at our church. That map right there, that blows my mind. That is absolutely remarkable to me. But as cool as that map is, and as incredible as it is to see what God has done and continues to do through you, I'm also reminded that it all started in a garage. That all started in a garage almost 38 years ago with 40 people who were committed to going, not staying, who saw people on mats all around them and decided that they needed to do something and those 40 could not have imagined what God was gonna do with a group of people committed to going and what it would be today. And here's what's crazy. See, I believe that what's coming for us, it's gonna blow our minds in the same way. If we keep going, if we keep going, that's who we're gonna be. But let's just talk a little bit more personal. Let's make it a little bit more personal. The question I think you should answer and I should answer for our lives is the question I think Jesus puts in front of us is this. Who am I bringing to Jesus? Who is it for you? Who is it that you would tear down a roof if it meant you could get them just a glimpse of Jesus? Who is it that you love so much, that you care so much about, that you just want to see them know Jesus, because you know they're on a mat right now. Who is it that just dri drives you to your knees? Pray for them, because you just so badly want them to know Jesus. Do you have a name? And if you can't think of someone, if you can't think of a name, maybe today God's stirring up your heart and just saying, it's time to, to go again. It's open your eyes again to the mats all around you, because I promise you they're there. But my guess is that most of us have a name. 
And see, I, I can put all those stats up about the state, stats that give us the scale of an issue. That's really what it, it does. But what moves our hearts to action is not stats, it's names, isn't it? And I know that I know the stats are on addiction. They're just stats. But for some of you, that's not a stat. It's a brother. And I know some of those stats on marriage, they're just stats. But for some of you, it's a couple you know. And it's not just stats on depression. It's a coworker that you care for. You know, every single weekend I get up here to speak to you. I look down on my way up, and I look at the names written on the stage. There's thousands of names written on the stages all across our state, all of our different locations. I think 4,600 names are written down. Because years ago, we took time, and we just wrote down the names of people that we just want to see them know Jesus. And I look at those names every single time before I open my mouth, and I'm reminded of what's at stake that it's personal for us. For Butch, Keith, for Liz, for Grace, Mark, for Nick, and some of the stories that have moved my heart the most over the years are the stories that some of you have told me about the names you wrote down. And you kept inviting and you kept praying and you kept loving and now they know Jesus. Some of them have gotten baptized these last few years. And guys, I couldn't count how many stories I've heard just this last year from so many of you who've told me, man, I've invited my friend. I wrote down the name and I've invited them for three years, for six years. One person told me that at Easter they had been inviting someone for 10 years and it was the first time after 10 years of inviting they finally said yes. And I know for some of you it hasn't happened like that. But in the end, it's not our job to change people, guys. It's just our job to keep going keep going to them and investing in them, inviting them. And so today, I, I just wanna remind us that we're going to be an outward-facing church. It's who we're gonna be. That is a non-negotiable here. And there's nothing that serves as a more tangible reinforcement of that vision than I think the names that we carry with us, the people we wanna see know Jesus. So today, we're, we're gonna do what we've done before. I think it's the most appropriate way to end this series. We're gonna take times to write names down. And we're gonna place those names before God and commit to inviting them and praying for them and loving them. And we'll leave the results up to God, but we will keep going. That's our part. And some of you are here today and you're like, I'm not even sure if I believe all that. Maybe, write, your, write your name down. Maybe as an act of just saying, I wanna keep exploring. So at all of our locations, I'm gonna invite you to come up in just a moment. Come up front. There, there's markers. There's places for you to write. Some of them are on stages at different locations. Some locations have other ways for you to write names up front. Uh, just get there. Write the name down and then head back to your seat. You know, I, I know there might be lines. I get that. You might have to wait a little bit. But we set aside personal preferences here. It's worth putting a name down, bringing it before God, and just saying, God, this is who I'm, this is who I just want to, I want to tear the roof off for this person. And if you're online right now, grab a pen and paper around you, write down the name, put it somewhere in your home that you'll see it. Or if you want, we'll put a, a number here on the screen, and you can text this number with the name that we're going to write it down for you here on the stage, one of our stages. It's, you know, it's personal for us. It's personal for us. It's personal. Because there's still too many people down on the mat that Jesus alone can free and forgive. And we are going to go and invest and invite. So come on down, write these names as a recommitment as a church that we will be an outward focused church and these names are why we will do that. So come on down and write these names.
Is never fair. I've got stories I live.
we have, uh, we've seen God do amazing things here and we have witnessed it. We've witnessed amazing things and I believe we're gonna see it again and again if we keep paying attention to our vital signs. So let's keep prioritizing relationships, LCBC. Let, let's stay contributors, not settle for being consumers. And let's keep going to those who need to know that there is a God who loves them and can give them new life.